Uh, folks, thank you for coming to the Spring 2012 Social Science Forum. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Gary Goff today. I've wanted to do this forum for quite a while. We were able to fit it in. You have to call Chris the same way. You have to call to make a two-minute appointment when I'm like six months in advance <laughs> to have time to come in. I'm sorry it's finals week, and thank you for the turnout. Um, he's had, one thing I've noticed, um, have, being a military historian, is that it's amazing that he can be an administrator in that world and this world, because they're different. Um, he can't throw any of us in the brig, you know, he can't, um, <laughs> he, 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 in fact, he, he listens um, and can deal with faculty when, with his military officers. It's obviously a, a completely different world. You say, do it, they may ask for instructions and they go do it. I said, um, we don't tend to act that way. So, um, I think he's had a great career in both regards, and I'll let him explain it. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, my friends that are here, all of you I know are friends. Um, and uh, uh, certainly for the, the clerks, I want to say thank you for, for your attendance, and as well as the of those of you from Oracle and uh, participating in it, and then most of the staff and faculty here. Thank you. Um, I have a list, but uh, let me just start out by saying that uh, I had the great honor to to serve in the United States Army for 30 years. And in that career, um, the Army gave me great opportunities to do some interesting things. But I'd like to start, before I start that, uh, when I was uh, a freshman in high school, uh, I was living, my parents, my dad was in the Air Force, and we were living in the Panama Canal Zone at the time. Uh, in 1962 um, through 64, and uh, at that time, the Panama Canal Zone was considered sovereign property of the United States. Now it's been returned back to the Republic of Panama. But at the time, uh, we were living there at a base, Air Force Base, called Albrook Air Force Base, and uh, not being real sensitive to things, it was the first awakening I had of America's challenges in, in during Cold War, and that was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. All, of, all the U-2s that were flying out of Florida over Cuba were landing in the Panama Canal Zone at Albrook, and the films and all that were being downloaded, and then the next day the crew would fly back, over, the pilots would fly back over, going back, you know, to a round trip kind of thing. Well, anyway, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, all of us kids and our parents, our moms, were evacuated out of the Panama Canal Zone and moved to a tent city about 100 miles north of the Panama Canal Zone in a small little rural village called David, Republic of Panama. And tent city went up, and we lived there during the Cuban Missile Crisis, not really knowing anything that what was happening. But we knew it was something very serious because it was the first time that they evacuated all us kids and, and our moms up to out of the area and put us in a tent city. So at that point is when I, my recognition of that the world's an interesting place and that national security was important. So that kind of started as a freshman in high school for me uh, of, of an interest in, in what was happening in the world. And out of that, I was uh, uh, the first in my family ever to go to college. And, um, and as I tell people, I had no ex expectations of going to college or aspirations, but we all had a great high school teacher in our lives that, that saw more in us than we saw in ourselves. And through, uh, and this person's name was Don Chin, Professor Chin, taught uh, history, and through him, he saw more in me and encouraged me to go to college. Well, no money, no experiences. I was the typical Rome State kind of, of uh, traditional student. And uh, actually, he talked to me in March, and this was before Tennessee had community college system. And so, you know, back then, you had to apply for a university and be accepted. Well, I was late. He encouraged me to apply in March. So I applied. He, he helped me send out the applications. And, and, and uh, you know, I got, sorry, you're late. Wait a year. But Middle Tennessee State University sent a note back saying that 
that if there became an empty space, and if you could respond quickly, we'll, we'll notify you if there's an empty space. So, graduated from high school, went to work in the building construction, building houses. I was good at geometry, so I was cutting all the roof joists and uh, you know passing them up uh, to the carpenters as they were uh, putting them together. Those are the days before they came pre-assembled on your work site. So, um, a week before classes started at Middle Tennessee, I get the letter saying, if you can be here in a week, you're in. So, loaded up and went to Middle Tennessee. Uh, at that point, um, uh, you know, paying for college was a chore. So, and at that point also, the Vietnam War was going on. And so, uh, if you weren't in, and at that time, ROTC was mandatory for all male students. It was required. So, you know, having to be in college, especially in land grant colleges, and that was the de determination. So, all of the men at Middle Tennessee when I was going through had to be in ROTC. So, uh, joined ROTC, uh, and then eventually got an Army <coughs> ROTC scholarship that helped me pay for college as I went through because I excelled and did well in it. Anyway, I was commissioned a second lieutenant in infantry out of uh, Middle Tennessee State. And from that, set things up for me in the military. Uh, as, a, as a commissioned second lieutenant, I went off to uh, infantry officer basic course to learn skill sets of being an infantryman, a leader in an infantry unit, uh, then went to airborne school, and then went to ranger school. And uh, then after that six month window of training, I hit my first unit. And uh, I became a reconnaissance platoon leader. I had graduated number one out of my ranger school, and the battalion commander, my boss, was impressed with that. So he said, I'm going to make you the reconnaissance platoon leader. It sounded great when I was standing in front of him. There's a new lieutenant reporting in, uh, but little did I know that the reconnaissance platoon was an interesting uh, uh, unit. And so, immediately took over the platoon and we were sent to patrol the Berlin Wall in Berlin. So, I and my 35 troops uh, in a series of Jeep, gun, gun jeeps that had uh, 50 cal machine guns mounted on pedestals, which uh, was a was a trip if you were the gunner trying and driving at the same time trying to keep rounds on target. Anyway, so we spent uh, the next uh, six to eight months patrolling the Berlin Wall on both sides of the wall, on the east side, the Russian side, as well as the U.S. side. And so here, all of a sudden, I learned the. Cold War facts of life that uh, it is a hostile world. Now, that was the start of, of things, and, and I, during the 30 years, I just got down some notes, and this is a audience participation. All right, uh, I served in Vietnam, so I can talk about that. Uh, I served in uh, 71 through 72. I served in Honduras in 83 under an organization called Joint Task Force 11. It was during the Sandinistas uh, issues with Nicaragua and Honduras. I served in the DMZ of Korea of, uh, and was responsible for the military operations inside the DMZ, so we can talk about that. I served in Iraq um, in 91 uh, during Desert Shield, Desert Storm and continued through Operation Provide Comfort with the Kurds. I can talk about that. Uh, served in Bosnia in 95 and uh, was the lead military, U.S. military planner for the troops in Bosnia and, and did a tour in Sarajevo, so I can talk about that. Uh, I then did uh, uh, part of, following that, I did a tour in Hungary where we were, I was directly responsible for training the Hungarian uh, mil generals on how to become a war, a NATO force versus a Warsaw Pact force. So I did uh, spend about six months living in Budapest, uh, working with the Hungarian General Officer Corps and training them how to become a NATO-based military. 
Uh, I then had the opportunity to be the chief planner for the largest peacetime military exercise in the world in uh, the deserts of Egypt, which basically was kind of an interesting uh, sandbox to plan an exercise. We actually copied the battles between the British, the Americans, and the Germans back and forth across uh, the, the Egypt uh, battlefields. Uh, then obviously did a lot uh, with the Cold War back in Germany several times. And then I can talk about officer training in the Army. So those are the areas I can talk about. So what would you like to hear? What would you like to hear about? Korea. Korea. Okay. Uh, Republic of Korea, as you know, 1950, the North Koreans attacked. We were very unprepared. And uh, you know the Korean War issue. Well, after the armistice, and we're still at war technically with North Korea and China, what we have in place today is an armistice. And out of that armistice grew the demilitarized zone, basically which is along the 38th parallel, which was the original boundary actually before the North Koreans attacked in 1950. All right, now there is a, um, the DMZ is actually four kilometers wide. And there, the actual demarcation line is there through a series of yellow signs, about this big, on a yellow pole. And they're about every 500 meters. And the whole 38th parallel all across the, is the isthmus of Korea is marked exactly by these signs. These signs are actually the front line of the battle lines in 1952 when the armistice was, was uh, signed. Then, and on the yellow sign on the side that faces south is in English and Korea, talks about the demar demar uh, demilitarized zone, the DMZ. On the back side of the sign, in Chinese and, and in Korea, is the same notification. Then, two kilometers from the sign to the south is the edge of the DMZ on the southern portion. And two kilometers to the north is the edge of the DMZ that's in North Korea part. So this four kilometer zone is probably the most heavily armed, heavily mined, heavily patrolled piece of land in the world. Um, and, and I was the director of operations and managed all the U.S. military uh, operations in the U.S. sector of the DMZ. Now the DMZ is about 480 miles long across the Isthmus of Panama, excuse me, the Isthmus of Korea. And, uh, and there are U.S. sections are basically around Panmunjom. The rest of the DMZ is controlled by the South Korean forces. So my responsibility was for the U.S. sector of the DMZ that included Panmunjom. Um, up there we have two fire bases inside the DMZ on the two kilometer south side that belongs to the U.S. Um, and they're Olet and Collier, fire base Olet, fire base Collier. Now the armistice required only military police could be inside the DMZ. So I have a great MP arm band that every time I went into the DMZ, that's what I wore. But everybody in the DMZ is infantrymen, not military police. So we kind of get around that requirement that's in the armistice. We all wear military police armbands. Um, and on Firebase Collier and Firebase Olet, they're designed to provide protection in case North Koreans or Chinese come into the U.S. sector of the DMZ. It really is a fire base with mortars, machine guns, night observation devices, and all kinds of other technical systems that are in place in the DMZ. Um, the, uh, the North Korean Special Forces, when they train their Special Forces people, Part of their graduation exercise twice a year is in the month of March and in the month of September. They take their students who are about to graduate from their special forces training and attempt to infiltrate them into the U.S. sector of the DMZ. 
And their job is to go into spider holes, sit, listen, observe, and watch and monitor the two fire bases, the U.S. fire bases, Olet and Collier. So knowing that, we patrol every day. We send out infantry patrols from these two, these two fire bases that actually patrol the ground. I mean, it's mountainous, it's up and down, it's wooded, it's, 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 it's not just a flat parking lot. You see Pembroke John itself, it's fairly flat, but the terrain all around it is rolling in moderate hills and trees and woods and, and a lot of the old uh, battlefields, Pork Chop Hill, some of the other Korean War battlefields are on the U.S. side. And so it's, it's, it's almost like a cat and mouse game to go out and find these North Korean infiltrators and capture them. Uh, and so we up the number of patrols and we do a lot of different things. So it gets to be kind of a, an interesting conflict back and forth during, the, during that March and September windows when they come into the DMZ to train our special forces folks. And so our mission there is then is to capture them and turn them over to the South Korean government who then does whatever they legally do with them. However, some of them don't come along nicely, and we end up having firefights in the DMZ uh, to uh, kill or capture them. That's the mission. Um, one of the major uh, two things that occurred during my mission, my time in the DMZ, was North Korea is always starving. Their people, their rice crops, their, their ability to feed their people is next to nothing. And every year, the South Koreans, in a very generous but propaganda way, offer to provide tons of rice to the, to the North in partnership and we're brethren and common people, common language. And every year the North Koreans say no. So this one year in this generous offer from the South Korean government, the North Korean called the bluff and said, okay, we'll take it. I mean, <laughs> and so all of a sudden now, we had to plan uh, a mission to transport rice from the south to the north using the Freedom Bridge and using the Bridge of No Return that's inside Panmunjom. Now, Freedom Bridge is on the Imjim River south of the DMZ, and that's really kind of the limit. Everything else above the Imjim is kind of considered a combat zone. And so we had to figure out how to move. I mean, it was like three million metric tons of rice. And that, that turned out to be, of our 18-wheel tractor-trailer trucks, that turned out to be a little over 700 tractor-trailer trucks of rice that we had to plan to move <coughs> through the DMZ. So um, we were planning our side, and then we had to meet with the North Koreans to discuss the transfer process. Um, and so during that discussion, we decided that uh, the bridge of no return, which is you know the dividing line, is half in the, the southern part of the DOD and half in the north, that we would make the transition point on the North Korean side. So we would bring our trucks loaded across that bridge, and we had to bring in engineers to reinforce the bridge because it's so old and it just carrying the weight was a, a problem. So we had to coordinate, bring in engineers to reinforce the bridge. And that they would create a turnaround point so we could offload the rice onto their trucks. So in negotiating all of this, and, and in the DMZ, in Panmun John, there's, there's, there are observation forces. The original agreement dictated that the US, the southern, North, South Korea and US would have observers from Switzerland and Sweden. And they have been rotating their military officers in there since 1952. And they are observers to ensure that we're doing the right kind of things in the DMZ. And in the north, they have the Hungar they had the Hungarians and the Poles in as their observers. Now, that's all changed since Poland and Hungary are now part of NATO. But, but anyway, these different military officers were responsible for observing and reporting back and forth. So in interacting with all these different parties, we were able to build a process to do this. The funny thing that occurred about it is that, uh, 
you know, we collect intelligence on everything we were doing. So we had set up cameras, we had set up long range uh, devices, we had done overhead flights, uh, satellites and everything else to monitor all their trucks moving forward. Because we didn't want this to be a ruse for them to be able to maneuver forward armored vehicles and everything else. So we, we you know, we're going through all this intelligence collection. So anyway, the bottom line came is we made the, the, the transfer. It went well. Um, the Red Cross also supervised it because it was under the auspices of the Red Cross that we were changing and sharing the food. Um, and uh, the North Koreans could only come up with 200 trucks. And so they were brightly painted brand new. And every truck has a, in, in Hangul, in Korean, you know, kind of like the unit it's from and the truck number it is on the front bumpers. And so what was interesting is, as we were unloading the rice and such, you know, somebody kind of wandered around, just wipe their finger through the bumper markers. Well, what they had done is they were bringing the truck up, taking it back, and then recycling the truck but changing the bumper numbers. So, you know, part of the intel coup was that they only had the ability to bring forward 200 trucks compared to our over 700 that we brought in. And so you get kind of an interesting feel about what their capability is, what their, you know, their ability is. So that was one of the incidences in the DMZ. Then there was a negative one, one time, and, the, and if you go to Panmunjom, uh, it's obviously the old Korean War buildings that are still maintained. But on the southern side, there is what we call uh, uh, the uh, Red Cross Gardens. And it's a small little sunken area, which, which is an area for, for meditation. It's got beautiful area in it. And, uh, and the guard houses, there's one in the north, right on the DMZ of Panmunjom, and then we have one. Um, the one that the North Koreans have is a two-story building, very impressive looking, but it's only eight feet wide. It's very shallow. But it looks great and impressive when you take pictures. And they have guards there and they have people up in the second floor window, but again, it's, it's about eight feet deep. Um, they had two Russian Soviet Union at the time, uh, two Soviet Union uh, photographers and news people that they brought down out of the guardhouse into the DMZ to do a report. Well, as soon as those two Russians got to the demarcation line, they ran and requested on the run political asylum. <laughs> At that point, the North Korean guards opened up with machine guns on them. Uh, one of them was wounded, made it to our side into the um, sunken garden there. And, uh, and the other one kept running. Well, the North Korean guards came across into our sector and into the bowl area of the sunken gardens. And so our mission required us to return fire to protect and defend our piece of the DMZ. So we had a gunfight for about an hour and a half, two hours. Um, We had uh, three wounded. In fact, the young infantry, U.S. infantry platoon leader that had guard duty that day, had the responsibility for the sector that day, ended up winning a Silver Star uh, and a Purple Heart out of that. But, but you won't hear about this in the annals of America if it was not publicized or anything occurred. But it ended up that we, we killed about 24 of their North Korean guards that came into that zone and, and had three wounded because we were up on the high ground and they were down in the bowl and they were shooting back and we were returning fire. To the credit of the, of the Swiss officer, basically walked in the middle of this gunfire, kind of put up his hands to, to get, stop the fighting. And uh, got, how he was not shot, I don't know. But anyway, uh, the gunfight stopped and we, we had 24 North Korean guards killed. So we had to then go through the process of identifying and then go through negotiations about returning the bodies to them. However, the good thing is we fingerprinted them all, and we photographed them all, and we did all of that. And we discovered that one of the ones we killed was the North Korean soldier that killed a U.S. Army captain in 1976 when he and a detail were 
pruning a tree at the southern edge of the bridge of no return, which was our property, and that he was the one seen and actually photographed striking the American captain with the ax uh, and killed it. So we felt a great deal of joy that justice was eventually served on that. Um, so that was our two incidences that occurred during my watch at uh, the DMZ. Questions or comments? What happened to the fellow who ran across and was oh, wounded? Oh, uh, both of them survived. We were able to provide medical support to the one that was wounded. Uh, took a round right in the lower back. Um, uh, and they both uh, asked for political asylum in the United States. And as far as I know, they were granted political asylum. Yes, sir. I don't know if it's true or not. I, I remember reading once that because the DMZ in Korea is probably the most stressful assignment somebody can be given that troops are allowed to say, I've had enough. And, and the only U.S. troops time. aren't allowed to say, I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> On any mission. I, I, what we do, though, we, we are concerned about it, and we rotate them every three months. Okay. We only put them up for 90 days. Okay. And on the two fire bases, Olette and Collier, uh, that's 45 days. Okay. Because we we notice their attention, their stress levels, and, and such uh, grow, and their attention levels decline. We need them to be sharp and alert and ready to go. That's Korea. Any other topic anybody wants to talk about? Honduras, Vietnam, Iraq, Bosnia, Iraq. 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 Okay. Um, during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, um, the north, the Kurdish area of Iraq, who had been at a nemesis of Saddam Hussein for decades, and that's where the oil-rich area of Iraq's at. It's also where the wheat-growing area of Iraq's at, and it's also interesting that in the mountains there, in the Kurdish sector of Iraq, you get 12, 14 foot snowfalls in the winter. It's not desert like southern Iraq. And the group of people that live there are the Kurds. During Desert Shield, Desert Storm, we were launching aircraft out of Turkey that would fly over north Iraq and drop bombs in southern Iraq and in Kuwait and all that. And then we also had airplanes coming out of Saudi Arabia. And so the air war was on two fronts, basically. So part of my job was to go in and negotiate with the Kurds to build an exfiltration route for downed airmen in case any got shot down and ended up crashing in northern Iraq in the Kurdish sector. The Kurds are very pro-American, always have been. Uh, there's tremendous Kurd communities throughout the United States, and always has been, even before the war in 91. Uh, so my job was to negotiate, and there's three main groups of Kurds in Northern Iraq. There's the PKK, run by, uh, at that time, a gentleman named Barsani. The uh, uh, PUK, which is run by a gentleman at that time, uh, Talibani was his name. And then there's the Communist Party part of the Kurds, which is the, oh, it's been 20 some years, um, uh, P something, anyway. Uh, so anyway, those three factions operate in northern Iraq. Um, and so they're, they're very tribal, and you know, they're very much trying to advance one tribe or one over the other. Now, the Turks, and, and there's this belief that they want a, a uh, Kurdistan carved out the northern part of Turkey, excuse me, the northern part of Iraq, part of Iran, east, eastern mountainous area of Iran, and it's part of southern Turkey. And so they have been fighting the Turk military for, for decades over creating Kurdistan. And this is the communist part of the Kurds that are doing this. So, so Turkey took advantage uh, when the war was over and Saddam Hussein had to sign the agreement with Norman Schwarzkopf and do all the things he agreed to do. Turkey took advantage and launched some incursions, military incursions, into northern Iraq to hammer the, the Kurds that were going across the, the Turkey border and, and, and killing uh, Turks. 
So at that time, Saddam Hussein took this as an advantage. He was already weakened, but he decided that he was going to clean out the Kurdish area once and for all after the war. So he launched military forces up into the Kurd section, what little he had left after the war. And uh, the Kurds <clears throat> couldn't defend themselves, so they ended up fleeing into the mountains into Turkey as an escape from what Saddam Hussein's forces were doing to them. Um, so there was about 1.5 million Kurds living in the mountains in Turkey in the wintertime. The reason why they didn't get over the mountains and into the valleys where it was they could live was the Turkish army wouldn't let them. They were killing them and keeping them on top of the mountains because, again, they viewed this as a possible threat to their sovereignty. So uh, after working with trying to set up and, and interacting with the Kurds for, uh, during the war for uh, pilot exfiltration, air crew exfiltration, if any of them got sat down, I was still there. And so my role then changed to be the director of operations for uh, Operation Provide Comfort. And this was a U.S. and a NATO military operation to stop the dying of the Kurds in the mountains. They were dying at a rate of about 1,000 a day because of the harsh conditions, no, no food, no water, no medical. Um, and so we went in with a uh, special forces group, 10th Special Forces, uh, and we put all the Special Forces team up along the ridge line, living in and amongst the Kurds. And their job was to do an assessment of what the medical needs were, what the food needs were, what the housing needs were, and everything else. And out of that assessment, it took about three days to get the intelligence back. We landed them in by helicopters all along there, flying out of Insulik Air Force Base in Turkey. We were shocked that Turkey agreed to support this. What we did is we pressured Turkey to admit this was a humanitarian mission. And the world and the UN were, and, the U and NATO were really laying this on. So through the NATO agreement with Turkey, which is part of NATO, we were able to then devise this NATO mission to support and stop the dying Kurds. Um, so the Special Forces uh, then, so we used them uh, and flew in medical supplies, uh, flew in uh, tents and other things. And so for the next three weeks, the Special Forces guys were up there trying to help and stop the dying. And they were able to slow it down to about 400 a day. Um, and we had massive problems with dead bodies or what you do with them, all kinds of other things. Uh, and so then the, the mission adjusted a bit, and General Shally Kashavili was in charge of this. This was before he became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was just a three-star at the time. And, uh, uh, and so we decided phase two of this mission would be to create, so we named the Special Forces guys up in the mountains with the Kurds at that point, called them JTF Alpha. And then we called another element, JTF Bravo. And this was 17,000 NATO forces were going to go down into the northern part of Iraq and provide security for the Kurds to come off the mountains to come back home. And we really were a buffer from Saddam Hussein's military to, to, to convince the Kurds that we could provide their security for them to come back, stop dying, come back to their homes, and, and survive. And so we had 17,000 troops came from 13 different NATO countries. Uh, and so my job was then to do, conduct the operations of figuring out how to take 17,000 troops from, from 13 different nations and, and array them in, in such a configuration that the Kurds would feel comfortable about coming down off the mountains. Now, we were able to move this forward. One of the kind of the comical incidences of this was that uh, as I said, Northern Iraq is the curt, is the wheat belt for, for Iraq. And here was all this wonderful winter wheat out here in these fields. And so uh, I said, we need to figure this out, how to harvest this and feed the people and all that. So a little bit more than what we had, we called the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they sent over a team to advise us on what we needed to do. Well, at that point, it was time to do spraying of, of, of an insecticide to, to protect the growing wheat crop. So out of that came then, okay, how are we going to spray this, I mean, miles and miles, we're talking probably 
West Tennessee size area of wheat crop. And uh, how do we do this? So we ended up hiring a Polish company to come in and spray the wheat field. Well, they happen to only own Russian hip helicopters with spray devices. Being somewhat naive, not being sensitive, when those helicopters flew in, the Kurdish leaders were beaten on my door unbelievably. Because what Saddam Hussein had used to gas the Kurds was Russian hip helicopters. So, I'm trying to solve this issue. So, I talked to the Polish company. Can you paint your helicopters bright orange? Okay, so we ended up painting the helicopters bright orange. And they go up and they, you know, we load, the, they load the, the, the insecticide and they're about to go spraying. And uh, the Kurds were beating on my door. No, no, they're still scared. So the compromise was when we finally able to, 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 to drive home to save the wheat crop so they could feed themselves was that I had to put an Apache helicopter flying trail with this bright orange Russian hip helicopter spray so the Kurds would know that they're under their protection, that if this guy does something wrong, the Apache will shoot him down. So, I mean, the, the, the kind of things that you end up having to try to negotiate are really squirrely and weird as we went through that mission. Uh, we were there uh, for a year uh, trying to work with and settle the Kurds. Uh, and if you look at the Iraqi war lately in, in 2002 and 2003 when we went in, the Kurdish area has been very stable. And I attribute a lot of that to the interaction that we had with them in 91 and 92 about dealing with NATO forces and NATO military forces. And so uh, they're very pro-democratic and always have been. And I, I feared when we went into Iraq uh, here in 2002, 2003, we would end up with three separate states in Iraq. We'd have the Kurdish state, the Sunni, and the Shia. And because uh, the Sunni are in the south, in the desert, uh, Shia are kind of in the around Baghdad area, and then the Kurdish are up in Mosul and everything else. Another incident occurred while we were there. Um, I got a call from a, a marine outpost right along the southern boundary of the Kurdish area uh, that was there as an outpost to watch um, that the Kurd military, or that the Iraqi military wasn't moving back into the Kurdish area. And I get a call and he says, I got two guys here saying that they worked in the, in the Iraqi nuclear uh, endeavor. And um, our standard response was, because we had Kur uh, Iraqis trying to defect and come and report, and we said, we're not here for a defection mission, we're here to protect the Kurds, so go away. That's really what our response was. Well, anyway, this was intriguing. So I told the sergeant, bring him in to the headquarters. They blindfolded him. They brought him in the back of the Humvee. They got out. They produced credentials and told me that the two of them had been working on the Iraqi nuclear project and that both of them had gone to the University of Glasgow in Scotland to go through their nuclear engineering program. And I had there a CIA team called a NIST team uh, that through their databases, I gave these names to the NIST team and uh, confirmed that yes, they were on the watch list that the CIA maintained of nuclear scientists that Iraq had. Well, these two gentlemen asked for a million dollars each and to defect to the United States and be given permanent resident status in the United States. However, their families were in a town called Mosul, which was on the Iraqi side. And so they wouldn't give up uh, and defect until we could get the families out. So I sent in a Navy SEAL team at night, and they went in and got their families. Well, while all this mission was going on, they were sharing with me that their research lab, where they were, and they were working on the triggers for the nuclear bombs that they were trying to build. And they were working, and in their laboratory, this is what they described to me. They went into a, a schoolhouse in Mosul. They went down an elevator system 10 stories. They went through a tunnel system with a golf cart for about three quarters of a mile 
and that their lab was built 100 feet under the Tigris River. Now, as a military planner, trying to destroy a lab 100 feet under a river is impossible. But that's where they were, and that's what they gave us the information in the school, they gave us all this information. Needless to say, when I told the, the CIA they, need, they wanted a million bucks each, in the dark of night, you know, an un, unregistered black airplane shows up, and two suitcases with a million bucks, and by then we had the family, so we loaded them up on an airplane, gave them a million bucks, and away they went. I never saw them again. Um, I personally, in Northern Rock when I was there, saw acres, acres of chemical munitions, artillery shells, mortar shells, and others, acres of it. Uh, in fact, I had to uh, use NATO forces to, to uh, protect those storage sites of chemical weapons because the Kurds were trying to steal them. So we ended up posting guards and, and controlling it. Um, so the dialogue that occurred in, the, in 2002 3 about nuclear weapons and ma weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, I personally was aware of the chemicals that were there. And I was aware of these two scientists who talked about their, their work on developing the trigger to blow a nuke. I knew nothing about bio, whether it was there or not. So in all of my understanding of this, I would dare say Saddam Hussein decided during Desert Shield Desert Storm to send all of his airplanes, his air force, to Iran to save it. And I would dare say he probably sent whatever chemical weapons or other nuclear projects that he had going into Syria. Um, but it was disappointing to learn that nothing was found when, 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 when the coalition forces came into uh, Iraq. So that was my experience in Iraq. Yes, sir. How do you, okay, you had 13 nations with 17,000 soldiers. Mm -hmm. If a Croatian unit gets attacked and has to call in fire support, how does that work? Okay, okay. good question, because uh, we had, as with any coalition, some nations put constraints on the use of their forces. For instance, Spanish forces could only be in the one town where our headquarters was, and they couldn't go out <coughs> and patrol, they could only do police operations in this town. So the Spanish brigade that came in, I had to find something for them to do, and that's what they did. Uh, uh, the British and the American forces could do anything. Um, uh, French forces uh, could only operate an independent piece of ground that we gave them, and they had total control of that. And so the coordination was, was somewhat strained. Uh, some countries sent in a world-class hospital. And so we had to, so we had to it's like a, a mosaic. And that's, there's a book called about Operation Provide Comfort. And it's about putting the different pieces together to create a mosaic of a picture. And that's the biggest challenge in coalition operations is, is learning what their countries will say they can do and not do, and then figuring out a role in the overall mission of the military uh, of what the, where their place is in this mosaic. And, and, and that was the challenge as the operations officer to figure that out. I mean, I had, uh, we had, uh, um, part of the agreement, Saddam Hussein, mandated that he has three palaces in northern Iraq, in the Kurdish area. One's called the Summer Palace. It's very much like Eagle's Nest, if you've ever been to Germany, what Hitler had, up on top of a mountain. Big, beautiful view, big, big, huge windows that looked out over the valley. And where the Kurds were gassed was they were living in that valley, cooking their meals and smoke and everything else, and that's the, where, those are the ones who got gassed, the ones that obstructed his view from that summer palace. Then he had a winter palace, which was down on the floor of the valley, where he grew apples and all that other thing. He, he required, because the Kurds, when they kicked out, the remaining Kurds that didn't flee to the mountains when the Iraqi military were kicked out by NATO forces going in, they basically ransacked everything. <coughs> and he wanted his palaces protected, so part of the negotiation was he was allowed to put an infantry platoon guarding the summer palace and an infantry platoon guarding the winter palace. 
Was that behind your line? I'm sorry. Yeah, it was inside the area that we were protecting. And so I was assigned an Iraqi Brigadier General to be the liaison to us. Um, and it's funny is, you know, he arrives with a driver and a sergeant and a big Mercedes. So I just asked my intelligence officer, go out and get the VIN number on that Mercedes. Because it's parked out there. So we found out that the VIN number was a stolen Mercedes from Kuwait during the Gulf War. Um, and uh, he had, uh, part of the agreement was he was given a card that sat in his uh, uh, windshield and we distributed the pictures of the three of them to all of our units that he had the authority to move around the area. <coughs> so he could drive and check on this group that are up in the summer palace or this in the winter palace. Well, he made the mistake one day of going through a Kurd village. The Kurds weren't impressed with our little sign that was sitting in the windshield of his car. They stopped the car, they drug him out, and they had him rope around their necks tied to a lamp post, about to hang them. Well, a young army sergeant military policeman driving through on patrol saw all this, stopped it all, had to shoot a weapon up in the air to kind of control the situation, cut the three of them down, loaded them up back in the Humvee, and brought them up to our headquarters. And so I'm in there interviewing him, and this guy, this general, was just scared as hell. Up until that time, he was real arrogant, real hard to work with. <laughs> uh, but after that, for the next two weeks that he was there with us, man, there wasn't a thing that I couldn't get by him or we couldn't do. He was recalled back to Baghdad. In a meeting with Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein shot him in the head at the meeting. And so we then got a brand new two-star general now that was reassigned to the headquarters. And so through intelligence, we ended up learning that what happened to this guy. And, and he was accused of being too soft with us after that incident. So that, that's kind of a quick on Iraq. Anybody want to talk about Honduras or Bosnia or Vietnam or whatever? Cold War? Vietnam. Vietnam. Okay. I was 22 years old. An infantry captain assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 501st Infantry, 101st Airborne Division. I was given uh, command of Alpha Company. And uh, uh, Several observations. Uh, uh, immediately linked up, said hello to the sergeants and the other lieutenants in the company, loaded up in a combat assault in a, in a series of Hueys, and 180 of us ended up <coughs> deploying into the Asha Valley. Great way to know everybody and learn who they are. And, and so for the next 21 days, we patrolled the Asha Valley. Um, and uh, as, and, and part of what we did, uh, you know, I had, uh, we would, um, and my mission was to take a piece of ground and wander through the ground and try to find the enemy. And if I find him, kill him, destroy him. If he was bigger than me, I was to hang on to him and call for help. And other units would fly in and do combat assaults. And so then we would jointly attack whatever we stumbled into. Now, um, there is a series of fire bases all throughout, and these are on mountaintops. I'm sure you've read about those, seen movies about them. There was uh, artillery pieces, uh, mortars, and everything else. And so whenever we moved in this area, we were underneath the umbrella of the artillery from that fire base. Uh, if we were outside, then we had uh, gunfire from uh, attack helicopters or fixed aircraft. Um, and then if it really got hot, we got it all. Um, so, uh, what part of South Vietnam is this? Uh, this is up in the north in the Asha Valley, right below the DMZ between South Korea, or, uh, South uh, Vietnam, North Vietnam. Um, it was across the Laotian border. Across from the Laotian border, and it was the main avenue of the Ho Chi Minh Trail coming south into, into Saigon and other areas. Did you have a mention what year this was? I'm sorry? What year? It was 71, 72. Okay. Um, which was the interesting thing because when we were patrolling, we kept coming and see, having been in Germany before I went to Vietnam, 
I knew what tank tracks looked like and armor tracks because I had some of those in my unit. Uh, and we would, we'd come across trails and we'd, we'd see armored tracks. And so I'd report this and, uh, and, and I'd be told, no, those are just bulldozers, bulldozing the roads. And I said, hey, these don't look like bulldozer tracks. These look like track tanks from an armored vehicle. Anyway, there would be days during this 21 days, we'd just wander through the woods. We wouldn't see a thing. And then about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we'd go to ground. We'd create a night defensive position, NDP. I'd put out listening posts, we'd put out claymores, we'd put out ambush uh, sites, and the rest of us would be in a 360 defense. I'd register artillery, I'd register illumination, so if something happened during the night, we could respond. And uh, we'd sit there half alert, half asleep, uh, you know, every other man at work, uh, uh, awake, and we would defend ourselves in case attacked. Then at about right before dawn, we'd have uh, stand two, which means all, all of us were awake, and we'd go through what we'd do as a mad minute. And that's where we would, for a minute, just fire every weapon we had, shoot artillery. And this was a way to protect us as we got all ready to go to start walking through the jungle again looking for the enemy. So if there was enemy around waiting to ambush us as we moved out of our NDP, we were able through firepower destroy whatever he might have had out there. So that was the tactic. So we'd walk. Some days, we'd, like I said, we'd find nothing. Four o'clock, we'd stop again. Uh, other days, we'd walk 10 minutes and be in a big, big fight. Uh, but the interesting thing, and then after the 21 days, we would be taken out of the field and put up on top of the fire base, securing the fire base for the next seven days. So during those 21 days down in the field, there was no showers, uh, no change of clothes. You wore the same clothes for 21 days. Your only shower was a blessing if it rained. Um, you carried 85 pounds of stuff on your back. And that 85 pounds consisted of about uh, 30 magazines of M16 ammo, with 20 rounds of magazine, 100 rounds of uh, machine gun, M60 machine gun, one mortar round, or an 81 millimeter mortar round, uh, three claymores, six fragmentation grenades, three smoke grenades, 10 quarts of water, um, other odds and ends, I carried a secure device, so at night when I talked to, to call in artillery or everything else, I could plug in my secure device, which scrambled my voice, and that weighed 25 pounds by itself. And so I was like signed for that thing and had to maintain it. So like I said, and the big thing that as I came out of Vietnam, I was wondering what the world was the strategy there? I never really knew what the overall strategy as a young infantry company commander, what what the strategy was to win. All I know is I would walk through the woods 21 days and then seven days sat on a fire base and then went back into a new area of operations for another 21 days. We were logistically resupplied every nine days, which meant we had, so we carried all this food, nine days worth of food on us in addition, so about 85 pounds. So you ended up walking around like this, looking for the enemy, bent over carrying 85 pounds with your neck kind of bent back. Um, so that was my role in, in Vietnam, and I never really totally understood uh, what the overall strategy was to win. So now every soldier who went to Vietnam has different stories. I was up in the Asha Valley in the jungle. Other other soldiers were in in, in rice paddy swampland. Other soldiers were in rubber plantations. The Michelin rubber plantations were in the Central Highlands. Um, so we each had different stories based on the terrain we were in. Up north, the monsoons hit, so for about four months, 24 hours a day for four months it rained. And so when you dig a foxhole at night to sleep in, I mean, you roll up in your poncho liner and the next thing you know you're sleeping in six inches of water. So you're always wet. Probably the coldest of my life was during the monsoons in, in the mountains of Vietnam because I was always wet and I never had anything really dry. I carried three poncho liners with me, and so I tried to rotate them so at least I could get something dry, but I was always wet. So 
Um, I, I said I was 22 years old. I was responsible for 180 soldiers. Um, I was scared in Vietnam. Not physically scared for myself, but I was scared I'd make a dumb decision and cause one of those soldiers to get killed. Um, so I took, I didn't sleep at night, so I took 20 10-minute naps during the day and night. Uh, so we, we walk several miles. I'd call a halt, send out patrols to check the area before we move forward. And while they were doing that, I'd lean against a tree and catch a 10-minute nap. And after that, I was ready to go. So I would do that 20 times during a 24-hour day. That was kind of my sleep schedule. Um, and again, I, I, I did that because I'm fearful of doing something stupid to lose soldiers. At 22 years old, that was, that was what I did. How long did you do that? A year. Did you do two combat tours or just? Well, I did a tour, combat, considered combat tour actually in Bosnia and in Iraq and in Vietnam. Can I ask what your assessment of North Vietnamese soldiers were? Uh, the, 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 my only contact was with their guards at Pan Oh, no, North Vietnamese. North Vietnamese. They were hardcore soldiers. I mean, they were darn good. Darn good. Um, their ability to track, their ability to move through the woods quietly, the jungle quietly, their ability to, to live on next to nothing. Uh, whenever we got into a firefight and we were able to, to, to interact with, with either captured North Vietnamese or or uh, dead soldiers, um, we'd go through their gear for intelligence purposes, and you know they'd have a sock with half full of rice, and that was all the rations they would carry. Um, they'd have one little quart of water, and here we're carrying ten quarts. Um, they 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 probably the finest light infantrymen in the world at that time. Now, were we a match? Yeah, we were. We were heavier but we were, had more technology on our side, night vision, starlight scopes, all the other kind of thermals. So we, we offset their advantage of being the finest light infantrymen in the world by using technology to augment us. So it was a fairly even fight. Any questions? Yes, sir? I'd be interested in hearing about Berlin. Uh, uh, Berlin? Yeah. During the Cold War? Yeah. Okay. What years were you there? Uh, well, I was there 69 to 71, 77 to 80, 87 to 91, so several times. Um, at that time, again, uh, when I first got there in uh, uh, January of 70, um, Cold War was still hot and heavy. Um, and, and our job was to patrol the U.S. sector and also do patrolling into the Russian sector. Um, we did it in gun jeeps. We did it in two gun jeeps for a patrol, eight people. Uh, and we had patrol routes, and I'd brief them in the morning as a platoon leader and say, OK, team one, you're going to take this route. Team two, you're going to do that. If something should happen, there's an opportunity for her to move quickly to reinforce. Team three, you're going to here. Team four. So we, we varied the routes all the time, so we weren't in a common route. So we would drive through the streets of, uh, of West Berlin on our side, interacting with the people. We'd drive through the streets in East Berlin, interacting with the people. And it's amazing at that point just how friendly East Germans were to us, especially when there was no Russians or East Germans around, guards or the BOPO, their, their police force, were around. It's amazing just how friendly they were to us. Uh, they'd stop and they'd chat. And as soon as they'd see an Eastern policeman or something coming around the corner, man, they were gone. So we'd get back on the road. Um, we'd stop for lunch <laughs> in East German gas houses uh, as part of patrol, just being seen. And we wore, uh, and sometimes uh, we'd change the uniform. Instead of wearing our fatigue uniform or, or battle uniform, we'd wear our greens, you know, our dress uniform on patrol. Just, Bury things up. Uh, and so pulled into this one German guest house, and sitting in the table right next to us was four Russian officers. And we're sitting over here. And 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 in the guest house, uh, they had white linen tablecloths and they had flower centerpieces and all that. And so it was an evening meal, actually, I think. And uh, so the four or five of us ordered Chateaubriand for, di for dinner. 
cost is about two bucks each. Um, and so we're sitting there and there's a piano player and he's playing piano and one of the guys kind of jokingly says, boy, I wish you'd play, you know, uh, Blue Moon. It wasn't two minutes later, he's playing Blue Moon. And so it's like, whoa. Uh, and, uh, and then kind of everybody's awareness went up and we said, well, we wish you'd play whatever song. And about three minutes later, he starts playing it. So, we're thinking maybe the flower arrangement is bugged <laughs> or something. So we're all lifting the tablecloth, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so it was interesting. The Russian officer sitting that far away from us was just glaring at us totally. And uh, they, they just apparently could only afford a bowl of, of soup. And here we are having Chateau Briand and, and, and other things. And, and it was interesting dynamics of just interacting with the Russians uh, in that mission. Um, we went out every day, 24-7, rain or shine, uh, to patrol the Berlin Wall. Uh, and that's really what the mission was at that time. As a, that was my first unit that I was in command of, was being out there doing that. So did that answer, answer kind of your question? Yeah, and with the year There was a gave, lot of cat and mouse kind of games going on. Were you there at the fall? The uh, in 89, yes. Which is hard to believe, 20, Two years, 23 years ago, I was, um, and uh, I personally hammered a chunk of the Berlin Wall that I keep in my office as a reminder of of of, of the good times of the wall coming down. Now, what I, was impressive to me was, and I didn't know the detail, the extent of the plan the West German government had to quickly integrate the East Germans into bigger Germany. But what they did was every West German community, no matter what size they were, as soon as the wall fell, the vice mayor of every community throughout West Germany had a designated partner city in East Germany. And they moved quickly into East Germany to become the mayor in transition to, to joining West Germany. <coughs> Uh, they also, military, the German military also were designated to move quickly to take command of the East German military in their barracks or wherever they were in East Germany. And so this massive plan that they had in place that within 60 days of the fall of the wall, the total integration of the country was completed through this massive plan that they had developed over years, I'm sure, about transitioning the eastern part of Germany. Um, now, I went in, I, you know, when we were there defending West Germany, there, there are natural avenues of approach that the Russians and the Warsaw Pact countries could use to attack into West Germany. Fulda Gap, you've probably heard of that. It's a big, long plain that's wonderful for tank warfare. So having defended that for several years, the West German side, I wanted to go look and see what it looked like on their side. So about three days after the fall, got in my little car, drove across. And the infrastructure, it was like I was going back into a 1930s movie set when I got into East Germany. Um, all the infrastructure was dilapidated. All of the street lights were the 1940s kind of street lights. All the street signs, 1940s kind of thing. It was like stepping back in time. Well, what the West Germans also did was, as an East German, the rate of East German mark to West German mark was one East German mark, uh, one, uh, 50 East German marks would buy one West German mark. So it was a 50 to one ratio. One of the transition plans that the German government had was whatever East marks you had saved in the bank, East Germans, will match it one for one. Okay? So all of a sudden, what, you know, that, that helped them. And then within a week after that transition occurred, and all the way, and again, the bankers went over and took control of the East German banks. I mean, it was just, you name the industry, manufacturing, the manufacturing folks moved over from West Germany and took control of the East German manufacturing. Now remember, Russians were still living there, Russian soldiers were still living there for about eight months after the fall of the wall until they were actually negotiated out. 
uh, and the West Germans had to buy housing in Russia to have the German, the Russian forces move back to Russia. It was interesting they had to, to do all that. Um, so watching that fall and the transition of how it went. Now, the Autobahn system is from the 30s in Germany. The part that was in West and East Germany was so dilapidated, you you know, every crack in the concrete would be a major <laughs> I mean, you couldn't go more than 20 miles an hour on the East German Autobahn. It was terrible. And their cars, you had to wait a year, sign up a year or more to get a Trabi. If you've ever seen one, it's, it's a lawnmower with a fiberglass top to it. Um, terrible car. Uh, but these people would wait and get on lists and buy these things. Well, as soon as the West German government gave them one for one in their bank accounts, they all came to West Germany and bought up every used car they could find. And at the military uh, place where I lived, when I, I mean, we were, I mean, they were knocking on doors asking if you wanted to sell your car. And so, but there was no, for a period of time in West Germany, there were no used cars available because they went back to East Germany. And then the, the West German government has had to do an awful lot, and, and there's some animosity still today, 21 years later, because all of a sudden the West Germans, who the glass was full, now had to share their full glass with the empty glass of the East Germans. And so now they view their lot in life half full because they've had to prop up the east side of Germany. The government, German government gave industries in the West big monies to move industries into the East to help those folks. The, the Autobahns were so bad that the Germans, West Germans said we can't repair them. So what they did is they laid parallel Autobahns against the old ones and ended up ripping out the old ones. It was so bad when, I, as I said, about three days after the fall of the wall, I'm, I'm on this, this uh, Autobahn that runs between uh, Munich and Berlin, and I was in the town of Jena, which was in the eastern side. And I'm driving through this, and I'm looking down the road, and, I'm, and it's like I'm dreaming something. I see the overpass above the Autobahn fall in the road. The bridge over the Autobahn just fall in the road, and there's two cars trapped under it. And it's like, no, I just didn't see that. <laughs> so I drive up. Fortunately, it didn't kill anybody. But I'm just saying that was how dilapidated the infrastructure was in East Germany. So uh, if you go now into the, the former eastern part, in fact, the chancellor of Germany today, Ms. Merkel is a former East German. Um, and so the connectivity and the, the settlement of greater Germany has really gone well through the transition planning that the West German government put in place. The West German government moved the capital from Bonn within a week to Berlin, which is traditionally the old capital. So that transition as the fall of the wall really came. And I was just there two weeks ago. And I will tell you, in Germany today, you talk about alternative energy use. Uh, before Heidi and I got married, she owned a home in Germany. So we went back to do some things with the home. And uh, in the village, actually it's not a village, it's the town of Amber, 50,000 people. Um, I would say that 45% of the homes in her town have solar panels on the roof. You go to a little German village out in the middle of nowhere, 100 houses maybe, three quarters, half to three quarters have solar panels on the roof, and then that little town's also got a windmill. And in one little town I found at where it's a great guest house, so we always, when we're in Germany, go to this, this guest house in this little village, because it's a great schnitzel. Um, they actually take and produce their own ethanol, in addition to having a windmill, in addition to have most everybody have solar power. So when I asked our neighbors who have uh, solar panels on their roof, why does this happen? He said, well, the German government subsidized <coughs> all of the citizens buying these things, and, uh, and it's reduced the consumption and the use of oil, because I was paying $6.90 a gallon there two weeks ago. Uh, and so they've gone to alternative energies and wind. And, and you can drive through Germany, and you'll find sections that have 40 windmills. 
at which, and, and then I found interesting, as, as valuable as German farmland is, I saw acres of uh, solar farms out there on the ground. Just stunning to me, of, and, I have, and it's been four years since I was in Germany, and that four years is just stunning to see what, what's occurred in, in alternative energy. So if you're interested in how it can be used and work, it's a viable option to go look at. I've chewed your ear for an hour. I thank you for listening to my stories. Um, I will say in closing that I've certainly enjoyed my 30 years as an Army Ranger. I look back on many of the things that, uh, that, I, that I look back on. And uh, probably one of the proudest moments that I can think of was Christmas Eve in 1983 um, in the border area between Nicaragua and Honduras. Uh, this is during the Sandinistas, uh, the communists who took over uh, Nicaragua supporting the, the uh, guerrilla war in El Salvador and made threats to do armor attacks against Honduras. Uh, they received two, three Russian tank brigades worth of equipment from the Russians. Uh, Daniel Ortega was the leader and he was threatening to attack Honduras. Honduras asked for U.S. military support, so I went in as the operations director for JTF-11. So this one Christmas Eve, um, I got told that the bishop of Hond the Catholic bishop of Nicaragua is an American citizen. His assistant is an American citizen. They've been living in Nicaragua for probably 30 years. He was the bishop of the country. And he went out to the northern coast of Nicaragua, and that's where the indigenous people live, and they're called Mosquito Indians. They're very democratic, tribal, about two-thirds scale models of maybe my size. Um, but really, really uh, hardworking people. And they're anti-communists because they believe in family loyalty and democracy. Well, the Sandinistas were running airplane air raids against them and scraping their villages and killing them. A Catholic bishop and his assistant went out to one of the villages and to say uh, for Christmas uh, masses and everything in the village. Well, while there, that village was strafed by the Sandinistas. And the village leaders decided to move to Honduras, where other Mosquito Indians were living along the north coast, along the uh, Caribbean, uh, to uh, escape this persecution from the Sandinistas. So they asked the Catholic bishop to provide his protection as they packed up and, and marched through the jungle uh, about 112, 115 miles. He agreed. The Sandinistas immediately put out propaganda uh, saying that the Mosquito Indians kidnapped the bishop and were forcing him and holding him against them. And so that generated their authorization from a global perspective to conduct more attacks against the Mosquito Indians. Um, like any good soldier, the, the tribe, the Mosquito uh, Village, sent out advance party to kind of clear the way for the main body to come along. Well, one of our sensors picked up a uh, member of that advance party and reported that they had and were protecting the Catholic bishop and that he had been slightly wounded in, in the strafing. So my job was, and I, a Marine Corporal and I, he had a radio that we could talk to the Pentagon on a tech set. He and I went out and sat for three days before Christmas in the jungle along hopefully the crossing point where this tribe would cross the river that separates Nicaragua and Honduras into Honduras. So I'm sitting there waiting, and he and I are just, you know, chatting, playing cards, killing the time for three days. I mean, we were sitting there. So my mission was to assist getting the, the, the village people across the river, and then to get a hold of the uh, Catholic bishop and his assistant, who were American citizens, treat what wounds, and then fly them to the capital city of Honduras at Tegucigalpa. So Christmas Eve at about 10 o'clock at night, we were able to affect the evacuation of the bishop and uh, his assistant and uh, treat him, fly him to do Gusigapa. So the next morning, Christmas Day, we had a press announcement that he was fine and that he was not kidnapped, contrary to what the Sandinistas were putting out. 
and that he was personally testifying that the wound that he had, and he showed it, was caused by Sanities and airplanes strafing the villages. And that personally to me was probably the best Christmas Eve I've had in my life. And I, I just, a uh, little simple thing, but it, it uh, meant a lot to, uh, to save an American, two Americans, and, uh, and evacuate them. So that was, that was it. Thank you. I'm here if any of you got questions. Have you um, considered writing a book? My kids have asked me to do that. And I said, uh, look, I wrote one dissertation in my life. How about if I just do oral history on the paper? Have you started that? Uh, not yet. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you. I don't know that I brought an alumni team for you. Okay, good. Campus is playing, Kenny, you know me several years ago. Great. No, that's right.